My name is Miklos Balint, and uh, me and my co-presenter Ken Liu are from ARMS Open Source Software Group, and uh, today we're going to focus on compartmentalization in IoT devices. And uh, first of all, I should highlight, although most of you are very aware, very aware, very well aware that compartmentalization is important, and. Uh, we all know uh, at least one story when compartmentalization didn't go as planned and that had grave consequences. So this is important. But there are challenges when compartmentalization uh, needs to be applied to IoT devices. And uh, that's due to the fact that these are high volume, low cost, uh, low power devices. So there are compelling arguments for using uh, microcontrollers in these devices, but they have some limitations or, or constraints that need to be considered, uh, and that is that they have a small die area typically with limited hardware functionalities. They don't have a memory management unit, so uh, there's a single physical address space, which makes uh, compartmentalization more of a challenge than in a MMU-based system. They execute code in place in a flash, and they have a limited uh, amount of SRAM to uh, store data. There's also the problem of having a wide spectrum of use cases. They have each of them have, might have different threat models, and uh, those have to be considered. So any solution needs to scale uh, in order for them to have a reasonable penetration in this market, and all of this. Uh, means that there is a need for a holistic approach to IoT security. And first, uh, let's talk about establishing the right level of security. Uh, and uh, the b most basic issue is that if there is uh, some vulnerab vulnerability in the uh, business code, you may want to uh, separate security aware aspects of the system, so you create a secure processing environment uh, for them. Uh, and that works for some threat models. For some IoT devices, this is sufficient isolation. But in other cases, you want to be prepared to mitigate uh, the vulnerabilities in one of your secure partitions. Uh, and you want to. Uh, limit the impact of vulnerabilities there by isolating a trusted compute base so you separate trusted and secure components from each other and you you iso you separate the root of trust protect it uh, <coughs> but in this case there's still a concern if you have multiple tenancy on the secure side uh, one vendor might provide one secure partition, a different vendor might provide a different secure partition, and they may not trust each other's code, and in that case, uh, even more isolation is needed. You want, in some cases, to isolate all of the secure partitions uh, from each other. And uh, that, of course, introduces more and more complexity with all levels of isolation. There's an additional thing to be, uh, aspect to be considered. On the non-secure side, uh, some non-secure OSs are already supporting uh, compartmentalization for their uh, execution environment. And uh, in these cases, it's beneficial if the secure partition manager can be made aware of the executing non-secure context. Uh, and so, different access policies can be provided depending on the uh, active non-secure context when a call is made for a secure service or access to a secure asset. Just a brief uh, discussion of hardware isolation, which is the foundation of software isolation. Uh, you can either have physical separation in your system when non-secure code and secure code are executing on different physical uh, processing elements. Uh, in other cases, uh, you have temporal isolation, which means that you uh, secure and non-secure code share a single processing element, and uh, 
they, uh, the security is a state in the processing element itself. Now let's look at some uh, interaction scenarios and uh, I will primarily focus on crossing boundaries in a single processing uh, element because uh, that was the first uh, task that we were uh, addressing in the Trusted Firmware M project that we're working on. Uh, there are the, the problems I'm presenting are also also need to be investigated from a threat modeling point of view in a physical isolation, but uh, as I mentioned, I will focus primarily on, on, on a single processing element which has various execution states for the various components. So uh, the basic uh, use case is that you have a non-secure thread that requests a secure service. That is a crossing from the non-secure to the secure state. I will be discussing uh, isolated drivers, in which case you have some interrupt service routine that is implemented by a secure partition and you, want, you don't want to run that interrupt service routine in privileged mode. And there may be asynchronous events on the non-secure side that may, might preempt a secure execution. And uh, I will also discuss <coughs> those cases. Now the simplest uh, use case or, or, or the basic scenario for reference is when we have a secure state change, uh, a, a non-secure thread requests a secure service. Uh, in order to do that, uh, it needs a crossing from the non-secure state to the secure state and uh, in ARM's VA TAM architecture that is limited to some dedicated entry points into the secure system, which are called non-secure callable uh, address ranges. In this case, we need some sort of wrapper functions to uh, trigger some privilege management code that will help us check access policies for that given non-secure thread to perform parameter sanitization uh, on behalf of the secure partition set up the container or the secure partition I containment unit and then invoke the partition code and for invoking the partition code trusted firmware I'm actually uh, has two programming models we will discuss those later in the talk secure interrupt deprivileging de uh, this is the scenario when we have a device driver in an isolated compartment in the system. Now this flow uh, actually is, uh, has already been out there, it's, it's supported on, on legacy architectures as well, so this is not something new, but uh, it's important to highlight from a secure compartmentalization point of view. And in this case uh, a privileged interrupt service routine serves as a wrapper, it triggers partition management code uh, which sets up the sandbox to execute a deprivileged uh, uh, interrupt service routine which executes in the context of a secure partition. Non-secure interrupts, uh, secure execution can be preempted uh, in some cases. It's up to the system architect to decide if that is uh, an allowed scenario, but from a real-time point of view, it's, we anticipate that it's a quite common requirement uh, to have some real-time <coughs> behavior to provide real-time functionality on the non-secure side. Uh, and what happens in this case is that when the non-secure interrupt preempts a secure operation, the secure context is stacked. Uh, this is done by hardware on ARM V8M, and the non-secure interrupt service routine is executed uh, in a non-secure state. When the interrupt service routine returns, the secure context is unstacked from the secure stack, so execution can resume. There are some threats that need to be investigated in such a scenario and some challenges. We have to make sure that the secure state remains consistent for the duration of the interrupt service routine. Uh, this uh, can be done 
in a multiple ways. Uh, we'll again discuss some of that later. Uh, and there's also a con concern that uh, by using interrupts, uh, the secure execution can, the non-secure uh, processing environment can starve the secure execution. That's uh, actually a very complex problem and we'll not discuss that in detail <laughs> in this talk. Uh, there are uh, a lot of uh, aspects there and we can take the discussions offline. We've been looking at that, but uh, as I said, the time is limited. So, uh, as I mentioned, uh, there might be a need or, 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 or a benefit of <coughs> having uh, awareness uh, in the secure partition management uh, of the non-secure execution context. And uh, for that, we have a, a reference implementation provided as part of CMC's uh, a trust zone context management functions, where uh, any time a non-secure context, a non-secure thread is created, uh, deleted, loaded, or stored, so any context change happens on the non-secure side, there's a notification, a function call, uh, going directly to the secure partition manager to have the awareness, and in this case, we practically mirror uh, on the secure side in a client container the non-secure context if needed. So an example use case, a non-secure non threads are created. We create or we prepare two, non two contexts for these uh, non-secure clients on the secure side. When thread one calls a secure service, uh, then the first non-secure client context is activated and the secure service starts execution. Now in case uh, a non-secure interrupt preempts that operation, uh, and if it triggers a context change, then we get notification in the secure partition manager from the non-secure RTOS. Uh, and in that case, we activate the secu second context on the secure side. And if that makes a call to a, to a different secure service, then uh, that service call is uh, handled in a different non-secure client context on the secure side. If that returns, a uh, non-secure execution of threat two resumes, and uh, when th threat two yields, then we just uh, perform the same actions as previously. If a context change happens on the non-secure side, we again get notifications, and the original context can be restored uh, on the secure side based on that, and the first secure service can complete its execution. So <clears throat> this was just, of course, uh, an example use case, but uh, uh, there's uh, quite a big scope of, 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 of uh, uses for, for, for managing, for, for the awareness of, of states. And as I mentioned, all these context, uh, various non-secure contexts can be as associated with different access policies on the secure side. So thread one might have access to different assets on the secure side than thread two. It's important to note that this relies on non-secure context management and the non-secure RTOS. If there's a vulnerability in the non-secure RTOS, there is a concern that uh, assets will be served to an unauthorized non-secure thread, but it's important to note that uh, this vulnerabilities contained to the non-secure uh, processing environment. So, so if, if, there's a comp if the non-secure RTOS is compromised, assets might be mixed up on the non-secure side, but no assets are uh, exposed, which would anyway not be av available to non-secure entities at all. So uh, let's take a look at the two implementations, the two programming models that are supported by Trusted Firmware M. And one is uh, the one we call the library model, in which case uh, 
all secure services provided to the non-secure side or to other secure partitions is implemented as a function. This is closely resembles a bare metal programming model and uh, there's a very substantial support for this in ARM V8M architecture and so essentially each secure partition is a collection, is a library of secure functions. This is a, a synchronous execution model, so a non-secure thread uh, is blocked on a function call to the secure side and uh, it has a low footprint because there's an opportunity to allocate resources on the secure side on demand. So resources or can only be, it's possible to allocate resources only in case a, a call is made to one of the secure services. The other uh, programming model or implementation model that we are supporting in Trusted Firmware M is uh, the thread model in which uh, secure partitions are implemented as execution threads. This is a more robust, more prescriptive framework. Uh, there's a static allocation of all secure resources, uh, which makes it uh, more complex and more robust, as I mentioned. Uh, in some cases, it might be beneficial from a determinism point of view, but of course it has some overhead associated with it. In this case, interaction between the various partitions happens using uh, connections and messages, and uh, it's possible to have asynchronous processing of secure uh, service requests, and uh, this is why it's well suited for physical isolation. So if, if there's a physical isolation of secure and non-secure execution, and each has its own associated processing element, then this model fits quite nicely on the secure side. And with that, I would like to hand over to my co-presenter, Ken, who will <coughs> talk more about the interaction within the thread model. Hello, guys. So let's continue. So here we, uh, in the following slides, we will introduce the interaction uh, implementation in the thread model. Uh, we use a, a generic concept, uh, inter-process communication <coughs> for the name. So uh, the, the, <coughs> the IPC is uh, the uh, interaction name of the thread model only. So there are two kinds of the skill partitions in TFM. Uh, sorry, two kinds of partition in TFM, the secure partition and the non-secure partition. Secure partitions provide the secure services, and the non-secure partition just request the services. The non-secure uh, partition reflects the, the whole NSPE. Uh, NSPE stands for the non-secure processing uh, environment. So there's a one thread in, in the secure partition uh, after the uh, necessary initialization tasks, uh, it uh, runs into an infinite uh, while loop and the uh, wait message there. <coughs> all the and all the client call are sent as messages. The client call <coughs> was called by the uh, client skill cl uh, clients. And then the cl uh, the non secure partition is a client because uh, non secure partition uh, does not provide any service. And the client could be a secure partition too, because some secure partition needs to uh, request a service from other secure partition. <coughs> and in the uh, the, the entrapped have, uh, required by the secure partition is handled uh, asynchronously in thread mode. Uh, this is the uh, some this is the point different with the library mode. So there's a com Compartmentalization consideration for the uh, thread mode. So there is no shared memory between the uh, partitions. The memory is copied by uh, some streamed API. And the 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 mem uh, during the copying and uh, process, the memory is checked <coughs> for its integrity uh, to ensure that the memory belongs to uh, the uh, corresponding SQL partition. 
and the peripheral usage is all the same. Uh, also the same. Uh, to uh, the own the peripheral uh, belongs to one circuit partition is activated to be uh, to accessible only when the circuit only when the circuit partition is running. And we change the long term production uh, we change the production rule long termly uh, to uh, switch the isolation. Let's take an, an animation for an example. So the skew partition one requests a service from skew partition two, and the the memory will be the memory information will be sent uh, within the message, and the skew partition two will call the uh, system API read to get the, to copy the memory into its own area. And now you can see the uh, yellow rectangle means the uh, isolation board has been switched to a skew partition two. And why is good partition two want to uh, return the uh, result back? It calls a write function to copy the memory back to the uh, destination memory, and then the the result is returned back to uh, school partition two. And now school partition two is running, so the uh, isolation board is, has been switched back. So uh, we will not focus on the secure uh, partition scheduling or some, something because it's quite generic. We will focus on the non-secure partition and the secure partition inter interactive uh, on the ARM waiter M platform with trust on technology. The trust on technology uh, divided the whole uh, processing environment into two into two, one is called the non-secure processing environment <coughs> in the left side, and the right side is secure processing environment. The non-secure processing environment cannot access any resources that belongs to a secure processing environment. So since it cannot access any of the resources, uh, how can it call, uh, perform a secure call to request the services? So there is a staging area called a secure and a non-secure callable. Uh, for such kind of usage, usage. Uh, there's a secure gateway in the uh, in this area uh, to check if the call is come from non-secure uh, part and uh, check if the currently the secure call happening place is uh, in the secure and non-secure call area, and if the connection check passed, it will enable the calling to the secure side. Uh, during the secure call process. Uh, there are something. There are some requests. Some hardware uh, condition status has ch changed. The main change is this, uh, the stack point. The hardware sc stack point. Uh, we are transition to the uh, secure hard uh, stack point uh, during the secure core process. And uh, uh, do, uh, during the whole uh, during the secure core process, the general uh, purpose requests may keep same, and some uh, status uh, requests. Uh, change it, change it, and the important thing is that the uh, important, the most important thing is the hardware stack point. <coughs> so let's uh, take a, a simplest uh, case. The non secure single non secure thread request the secure service. The non secure side uh, one non secure thread request a, a secure service, and then the then first the uh, secure call happened, and uh, the hardware stack point switched to the secure entry area. And the secure entry area will call for uh, call the client API in the uh, SPM. So during the uh, non uh, non privileged to the privileged call, a call frame is generated and pushed into the uh, secure stack. And then the client API was uh, converted into messages, and the then the messaging and the scheduling would happen, <coughs> and the uh, destination uh, secure partition will uh, will be will be activated as running, and and it will be served uh, another message and uh, serve. Uh, after the uh, uh, the service is uh, is handled, and the result is returned back to the uh, uh, client API area. The, uh, during the return, returning process, the uh, stacked uh, call frame is popped out, and then we return the result back to the uh, non-secure caller. Uh, 
we noticed that there are two uh, client API here, one in uh, orange and another in yellow. The uh, client API uh, uh, for the in the non school side and the school side, the prototype and the behavior should be identical to the caller. The caller uh, means a, a one thread. Okay. So let's take uh, take a look at it, uh, something more complicated. The multiple non secure thread request the circuit service. So as usual, the first uh, secure call is performed and 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 the uh, secure partition is serving. And the first frame is uh, is pushed into the secure stack. And then uh, because our uh, uh, the secure partition uh, execution could be preempted by the non-secure side, so there is a chance that uh, the non-secure uh, uh, authors get uh, run again and another uh, thread uh, request and uh, and the second secure service. So, the second here comes the second uh, secure service, and the second uh, call frame is uh, pushed into a stack. So, and then. Uh, the SPM scheduler is working, and uh, we uh, trig uh, trigger uh, activate the corresponding SQL partition and uh, handle the service. And uh, after the uh, service handled, we need to return. But the problem is that the non secure uh, side, the non secure side shares the secure or secure intra uh, stack point. So there are two actually two frames in uh, are pushed into the stack, uh, which should stack which frame is the correct frame we should return to. Because we don't know the non uh, status now. So for this problem, uh, there are two possible uh, solutions. Actually, there may be uh, more solutions, but the, 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 the main solution, mainly the solution is uh, two here. Solution one is quite, uh, quite simple. Uh, here, the uh, first uh, skill call is, uh, comes, and uh, the the call frame is pushed into a stack, and the service is handling, and then during the uh, during the second skill call, it wants to call the client API in skill side to uh, to generate another uh, call frame, and we do a checking here. If we find that there's the exist existing uh, call frame there, which means that uh, your call, uh, a SQL a provides a SQL call is still ongoing, so we just uh, deny the second one. And the solution two, we pull up, provide another set of uh, APIs uh, running the uh, privileged mode uh, for the non secure atolls. The basic idea is, uh, idea is that we could uh, create we could prepare a corresponding a dedicated a skill stack for each non skew uh, thread uh, who needs the skill service. For the non skew thread, thread one, we could uh, dedicate the skill stack one for it, and so that the non skew thread two. <coughs> let's show, uh, let's uh, let's take a look at a real uh, working process. So the non skew uh, scheduler we are. Uh, we are uh, we activated the, the non skill thread one, so it calls the API to notify the uh, SPM prepare the skill stack for uh, the non skill thread one, and then the non skill thread one gets run it, and it make uh, perform a skill call. During the skill call, uh, his call frame uh, will be pushed into the skill stack one prepared for it. So and and then if uh, so the thread the non skill thread gets switched. It is uh, still the same. Uh, it, uh, non secure uh, scheduler will uh, sync with SPM to prepare the skill stack 2 uh, for the uh, non secure 3 2. And then uh, skill 3 2 may uh, perform the skill call. Okay. Uh, let's take a look at the interrupt things. So the secure execution. Uh, in the skill partition could be preempted by the uh, non skill side uh, interrupt. Uh, let's take an example. A skill call is performing and a service handling. 
service partition, service partition one is handling the service. And just before, uh, to, just uh, as it uh, script partition one is running, there's a non secure interrupt occurred. And then the context, uh, the context change would be something like this. They, there's a, there's a, uh, pre there's a preempted, preempted context uh, being pushed into the uh, uh, secure stack. Uh, but the non uh, and but the non secure non secure scheduler still uh, think the non secure thread uh, maybe one is is still running. It uh, associated the uh, preempted context with the current with current running non secure thread. And uh, it, uh, then it service the ISR in the uh, non secure side. So uh, the color is or orange. And after the ISA handled the interrupt, it will return back to the uh, saved context and uh, continue the secure execution in the secure partition. So, the trust on hardware ensures that no information is leaked to the non-secure side. So during the so the uh, secure context handling is a, is a uh, something a complicated complicated thing, uh, which means that the the context is saved in the secure stack and all the general purpose registers are clear to zero. And then how do we generate a magic number to the non-secure side to tell the non-secure uh, scheduler that uh, you have just preempted a, a secure execution, but uh, you don't know the content. So he just, uh, the non-secure side just uh, save, uh, save, the non uh, save the magic uh, into the, uh, the uh, non-secure thread context. And then after the non-secure uh, execution, is uh, finished, uh, finished, and then it's a switch back to the secure side. This is the non secure interrupt PMC secure service. And uh, for the. Uh, okay, Mr. Some, Mr. Some returning pass. So for the uh, secure, in, secure interrupt PMC execution, uh, it's a, a bit different uh, with a uh, non secure uh, interrupt. So here we have a, a secure call, and uh, the service handling service is handling the uh, service partition is handling a service, and then it finds that uh, it, the secure partition find it needs an uh, interrupt to finish the uh, service, so it calls an API waiting interrupt to wait for the uh, interrupt event, and then the scheduler will uh, return the execution back to uh, uh, potential. Uh, Partition. It may be secure partition, one secure partition, or the non-secure partition. And then the secure interrupt occurred. So the I, the secure ISR first uh, uh, created a message. Uh, you know, in the thread mode, all uh, APIs, all APIs based on the messages. So create a message and push to the service stack. And the, schedule, and the scheduler will find uh, will trigger the uh, the secure partition who is waiting for the interrupted uh, to running, and the uh, secure partition just uh, run and, uh, and handle the uh, interrupt and finish finish the service. And then after after all this process is done, and to we are uh, return back to the preempted color, uh, which may be secure or non secure. Uh, so the color is mixed; it may be orange and may be green. So okay, so uh, this is the uh, case for the interaction happened in the uh, between the partitions. We focus on the non-secure partition and the secure partition intact intact interactions. Uh, so um, okay, that's all. I think I will give the talk back to Mikhail again. <coughs> okay, so. Uh, just to summarize uh, the topics that we've discussed, uh, and this is a very brief summary. Compartmentalization in IoT is not trivial. There is no one size fits all. There might be different approaches to achieving uh, secure and non-secure isolation. We might have various considerations on the need for uh, privilege control both on the secure side and on the non-secure side. And uh, interaction between the compartments in the system may happen based on function calls, uh, inter-process communication, uh, 
type behavior or in case of physical isolation interaction may be as uh, simple as a hardware mailbox. In any case uh, it's up to the system designer to pick and choose the right approach both from a hardware a selection point of view to a software framework point of view. Trusted Firmware M project is focusing on providing a scalable framework which uh, tries to cover as many uh, of the use cases as possible with a single framework and so we try to provide uh, various build configurations to support uh, multiple configurations uh, uh, out of this uh, plethora of selection that's available uh, and we are trying to maintain a holistic view on the security of the system. So uh, with that I would like to uh, highlight a, 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 another talk that was made earlier by Ashutosh from our team where he was talking about uh, security and IoT in general uh, and how Trusted Firmware M implements that. Trusted Firmware M is part of the open source, open governments, trustedfirmware.org project. We have a team here uh, at the Open IoT Summit and we gladly take any questions uh, at the ARM booth via email or actually we still have a few minutes left so I'm we're open to questions at this point. Thank you. Any questions? Uh, did you consider to use uh, Artos native uh, uh, scheduler instead of scheduling inside uh, secure part? For example, by uh, adding some extension to support a plugin uh, some switch context code or something like that? So, uh, our primary focus was to, uh, in the first iteration when Trusted Firmware M was launched, the primary focus was to get a, a, a low overhead, a simple solution. Uh, now we're at the stage, uh, this is the second year uh, we're running the project, and now we're looking at making the solution more modular and to create more of an alignment to APIs. For example, uh, plug uh, uh, an API for plugging in standard OS interfaces or standard o OS uh, tooling for, for the scheduling part or for the interaction part. So we're looking at uh, various options for that at the moment. and. Uh, we are open to discussions uh, for uh, and 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 for any any proposals on 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 how to uh, solve that in trusted firmware. Mm -hmm. Thank you. If there are no other questions, then thank you for listening. <laughs>